my name is Thomas Med. I work at Forschmark, and um, this is really interesting for me to be able to actually apply what I graduated on 30 years ago, because I have a PhD in power system stability, but I never worked there practically. I worked with the core instead, and then suddenly something <laughs> turns up where you try to remember what you did 30 years ago. However, I was in another space in the frequency domain. I worked both with um, electromechanical oscillations, and Lynn was talking about 60 second oscillation time. They have maybe one to two seconds oscillation time, so much faster frequencies. And then I worked with voltage stability, which is instead slower. So I was sort of on both sides on the frequency span where we are right now. Uh, something is, you can't hear me? Not so close, okay. I see that singers and things like, they always put the really close, they almost kiss the, <laughs> okay. Let me go back here. I mean, me and Lynn are colleagues, so we've been cheating a little bit. <laughs> so the question she, oh, she poses here in the end, I will try to uh, respond to them. The title is very similar to Lynn's. It's nuclear instead of hydro. So let's just move on to the three different areas we will cover. First one is the load following or the slow control, if you will. This is something we have done, and this is something we can do again. I happened to be the reactor engineer on duty back in August of 1993, where we were spilling water in, in the north of Sweden. The, hydro, the reservoirs were full. So instead of spilling water, we took down the power. And this is daily and weekend operations. And, and it's not in the operation instructions that the control room can make this large um, load follow. But if you make core calculations, you could, we actually, this is, the, I went into the data catacombs that we have in Forsmark and found this after some research when we started to discuss these aspects. Uh, and th this, this is something that we will do when it's economically viable. And it can be done again. There is one limitation when we have a fuel failure, then we don't want to uh, pull a lot of control rods. And you have to do that to make this kind of uh, size. So that was the first part, quickly fixed. The second part will also be very brief. It's about the large disturbance control one part of the problem, as Lynn was referring to, when you lose one large source and you want to uh, minimize the minimum or <laughs> minimize the deviation, if you will, maximize the minimum, you don't want to have too low frequency. Uh, and um, the, this, this uh, sort of power system dynamics evolves around uh, this balance between the rotating pieces, you have the turbine, the synchronous generator, uh, and um, you have the, the power system here. And this is where you need the balance. And um, mathematically, it's the swing equation. That's really the sort of the essence of the, uh, of the power system. So it's, it's, really, it's really, from the mathematical, purely mathematical point of view, it's certainly much more condensed than describing a nuclear core. Um, that you have much more, you have, that you have basically everything except the electrical equations. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is sort of the whole dynamics of the thing. And what happens then if you lose, if you lose one uh, production source, then, then you tend to have a frequency deviation that looks like this. These are from our measurement computer in Forsmark, uh, when this, these curves are when Forsmark 3 had a, um, it was disconnected from the grid, just momentarily like that. Oscar Sham 3, a few years earlier, uh, had a slower decrease. It sort of first decreased a little bit, so it was over 10 seconds, and, and that might probably have contributed to the surprisingly less deviation when the larger unit falls off than when the somewhat smaller unit. But it was like a guillotine break from, the, uh, from nowhere. You just were disconnected from the grid in the first Mark III case. Now, in order to talk about what we can do, 
I need to get just a little bit into the control systems. Uh, by the way, we have the, 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 the guy who did, could you stand up, Torch Tanner? He is the guy who is behind all the control systems. <laughs> and I had the pleasure to give classes with him about this. So I learned quite a bit from Tord about how this works and what they thought. And that, that's really, when Matthias was referring to, you have to know what you're doing. And that is a great, much thanks to Tord, we feel confident that we do know what, what uh, we're doing. We worked at Atom at the time. Anyway, we have three large control systems, and they basically control the three large flows. First of all, we have the, uh, the level control, which is, uh, has to do with the feed water. If the level is too high, pump in less feed water by uh, controlling the pumps. And if the level is too low, you pump in more feed water. Uh, the next control system is the pressure control system. Then you operate the high pressure control valves. If the pressure is too high, you open. If the pressure is too low, you sort of close them a little bit. And the third control system is the power control. That is through the recirculation flow that goes through the core and the recirculation pumps here you increase the flow through the core when you do that. This is a boiling water reactor, so you have a mixture of steam and water. When you increase the flow through the core, you have more water and you have a more efficient slowing down of the neutrons. The neutrons are always born as fast neutrons and you have to slow them down before they can create a new fission. So this, and this response is extremely quick to the fission power. Anyway, the size of these flows are, this is around 1,500 to 2,000 kilograms per second. Then in steady state, that flow has to be the same. Otherwise, you would create infinite mass or a black hole here. Uh, so it has to be in balance, or not uh, dynamically, of course, but in steady state. And then this flow is, let's say, 10,000 kilograms. I, all the numbers I will give you is with somewhat less than one digit accuracy. So we have to sort of remember the type of uh, sizes we're talking about. Uh, okay, so in, in when it comes to the fastest way to get out power here, that is just to open the control valves. Boom, and you get out steam. That's the fastest possible way you can get out more power. And that is exactly what you do with the pressure set point adjustment that was there already in the origin. And in the original, this is the actual test that was performed on Forsmark II back in the days. And you could increase the power with about 10% by decreasing the reactor's pressure set point with a, a couple of bars. And, and you got the 10% increase in power output. Uh, note here that you get the steady state increase. Now, if we are going to investigate something that can be economically viable today, this is not really something we want to do because we don't want to, we don't want to operate with 200 megawatts larger output than we can. But what we can do is that we just put a step in the reference value of the pressure set point when we discover that you need to have something. And this is from the, we have also another really important piece of our learning the plant is what Eva Dagnerholm was referring to. We have made a lot of measurements, particularly uh, in when we did the power upgrade on Forsmark II. We maybe put in all sorts of sinusoids and, and step, uh, step changes into all the controllers. And one of which was uh, changing the reference value of the pressure. 0.5 bar. And there you see the response uh, on the, I don't like laser pointers, but maybe I will, there, ooh, no. that, that's not, that. you will see how, uh, anyway, you get a, a good response, it's almost 20, 20 megawatts. What we can't do really is to follow the specified curve. This, this is what it is, you get what you get. You can improve somewhat by also adding the, the, the continuous uh, control through the uh, recirculation pumps, but basically you get what you get. 
And then let's start discussing other detail here. In a way, <coughs> you would like to, let's pretend this one went further down. You would like to, as Andreas was referring to, put in something when you get down to 49.4, 49-point something low. But what you really would like to do is that, okay, when you get down to 49.3, you wished that you had done something before. So you did it on time. And then what you can do to, to make that happen is that you look not only on the level, but you can look on the derivative. I mean, these numbers are just numbers I proposed that are not necessarily correct, but somewhat reasonable. If you see that it's going down and it seems to be going down at a fast rate, then you can assume that we'll actually have a deep descend, and then you activate it. This, of course, had to be test would have to be tested to make sure that you don't get too many inadvertent activations. Now, what does the th this one I threw in over lunch after Evert's observation, so that's why I have to apologize for the Swedish uh, text here. Uh, but this is what, uh, what happened on Forsmark 1 when, the, uh, when Forsmark 3 fell off the grid. And here you see in the inner loop, which I haven't really got into today, this is the reference value for the fission power. And when you lose the frequency, it responds, just as Evert pointed out, in the wrong direction. Because due to the inertia, you feed out more power to the grid, and then you lower the reference value. So it would actually be better not to do anything at all <laughs> than to do this control. Now, this is the piece I want to focus on mostly for the most part of my speech. Because here is, is um, where we need feedback from SVK is they, if they are uh, interested in uh, paying for this service that we, could, that we would be able to contribute. And the thing here is, to, to, to hook on to what Maya was referring to before, that it should be cheap, economically viable. And um, in our context, in the Nordic system, we do have the master of, I mean, the, the main characteristics of the hydro is it's the master of doing this control. And that's why we haven't done it for 30 some years with nuclear. But is there sort of some little piece we can contribute with, with, with what Lynn was referring to. Well, the first response we saw before that we can contribute, and I believe I may be able to convince you that we can contribute also on the continuous control. But for a hydropower station, every water drip that you don't use now, you can use it later, hopefully at a higher price. But let's just say with the wind, it's the same for us. Any, any hour that we don't operate at full power is sort of a lost hour. And if we're going to decrease power with 1% to regulate plus minus 1%, the floor on the price that we have to charge will be that decrease. And the Finns, Seppo has concluded that there will be too few hours, and we tend to come to the same conclusion, too few hours to make it meaningful to, to go on with the investment. But I... I want to sort of suggest a, an Indian rope trick, in a sense, that you, you decrease, you, you regulate one plus minus one percent, but you only decrease power, let's say, 0.1 percent. And how is that possible? Well, again, it has to do with time scales. Uh, what is the limit? The limit is the thermal power. The thermal power is nothing we can measure immediately. It's calculated from the heat balance. And the heat balance is just to keep track on how much enthalpy do you put into the core and how much enthalpy do you get out from the core. Are you just stretching your hand or, yeah, some gymnastic exercise? Um, and it's basically, it should really say m dot steam times h steam enthalpy per steam minus m dot feed water times enthalpy for feed water. But we, we, since we concluded that feed water flow and steam flow has to be the same in stationary perspective, we use feed water, which we can measure somewhat more accurate than, than the steam flow. Actually, we don't even measure it on Forsmark 3, the steam flow. 
Um, and the dominating uncertainty here is the feed water flow. But the feed water flow looks like this. This is from real measurement, and I have noted here this is 10% variation. So the, the, there is a lot of uncertainty in the, it's not a, a really silent signal. And this means that it's not really meaningful to talk about thermal power in, on any shorter time scale than about, say, 10, 15 minutes. And uh, the, 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 the rules about uh, thermal power is on two hours. It's the average over two hours. So there should be some possibility to, to utilize this fact. Now, what was in the original design? You had this kind of frequency control, where you had a dead band um, between 49.6 up to 49, 40, uh, 50.2, I think. Uh, and then you had plus minus 220 megawatts. This is not really feasible today. Uh, we, we don't want to operate 200 megawatts lower. So what I propose here is something that is much more uh, modest, but it's continuous control plus minus 10 megawatts around um, 50 hertz. So in the, in the span from 49.9 up to 50.1 hertz, you would um, regulate plus minus 10 megawatts. Um, this is a little bit busy. Slide maybe, done by Tord back in 1975. Still, it's the best, uh, it's the best uh, overview that I have seen. Down here, you have very simplified models of the, of the core. Uh, the core is such that you have to do specific black box models for every application. Um, and this one works fine for uh, full power operation. And the dominant behavior you see over here, here you see the thing that is, this is far from non-minimum phase. If you have a non-minimum phase, you have a minus here on, on this one plus S times 10, let's say, over one plus S times two. Uh, the waterways and things like that, you have a minus up there in the denominator. Is that Talia in English? Denominator, nominator, or the other way around, whatever, up there. Minus there, and we have not only plus, but we have a higher number there than there. And that has to do with the fact that when you, you flow through more water through the core, the fission power responds immediately. The, the generation time for each neutron is, you know, fractions of a second. However, the sort of the feedback in terms of the void or the steam, void is the fraction, the, the volume fraction, um, at a certain level, actually, strictly speaking, uh, towards uh, the, the full uh, space you have there. And in the outlet of the core, you have 80% is steam uh, or void. And, and th that one sort of you increase the power, you get more void, and you get a, sta stable, a stable operation. However, the increase comes first, and the void becomes time delayed. You can approximate it with a time constant of three seconds, and it's just because it's, um, it takes time for the thermal convection. It's thermal dynamics or thermal heat transfer. You have some 4% is immediate due to gamma deposition, but the, the other 96% has to be heat uh, conducted through to the core. Um, so this, this is an important factor, and actually, with, with, the, with the power that you have in the, in the uh, frequency converters that drives the recirculation pumps, if you would have an error and you wouldn't have these cautious filters and ramps here, then you would be really close to uh, being able to have prompt criticality. And that, you know, then it goes then it's the bomb, more or less, so, so to speak. But it's, it's, it would, it's, we're not there quite, because you wouldn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, just the mechanics and everything is so slow that 
but you would have an increase from 100 up to 700 percent. So it's more powerful than the pressure transient, which is known in, in BWRs, which gives a, a, a really short-term power of 300 percent. However, we do have these, and we have them individually on each pump, so it's, it, it is pretty safe. But we, we filter too much. We, we just If we know that this is the case, we can be tougher here. And, and fundamentally, this is sort of the inverse of that. So what dominates this in closed loop is actually our controller. And in order to fulfill the requirements that uh, Andreas and others, Niklas Modig and Robert Eriksson has published, we would have to modify a little bit in the PI controller, but we can do that. Now, how to implement this? If you take this shaded piece here, um, here is the new measured Newton flux, comes into the Newton flux controller, compared with the reference value of the Newton flux, this was the piece that went in the wrong direction, and in the outer loop you have the electric output fed back in a slower outer loop, and it's a PI controller, as somebody asked David before lunch. Actually, the time constant there, there is 60 seconds, not 25 as indicated on, on this slide. It was probably changed later on. What you would do is you would add a modulation signal here on top of what you already have. And then you have uh, add that to your control error and you would have your feedback from frequency. But what you also would do, because if you just take a sort of a typical data set of the frequency change, it goes up and down. So even if you don't do anything, your average value will be, I mean, if you regulate plus minus 1%, your average value will maybe increase 0.2% or 0.3%. But you can make sure that it's controlled by adding a really slow outer loop. You take the thermal power, you use a filter with a time constant of half an hour, 1800 seconds, and you have a really slow PI controller with an integration time of 400 seconds. These are the parameters I've been using right now. So try the algorithm on a data set. It took us some measurement. In the measurement computer, we measured the frequency, half an hour data, worth of data. And then another thing that you also must realize is that when you measure the fission power, you measure it with detectors, and it's tremendously noisy. The blue signal here is the measured fission power. And it goes up like this, plus minus 2%. And the added uh, consequence of putting in this frequency control would be either the, the red one or the black one. And the black one indicates, sort of indicates the difference between having the outer loop and not having the outer loop. So if you look on, on this and you, for instance, say that you reduce power with 0.5%, the red one here would be with frequency control and the blue one without frequency control. And if you take some portion, you zoom in where, where the red one tends to be high, it looks something like this. Now, the way I convinced myself that this would not be a huge problem for the plant is to think about what does the controller see today? Sit yourself here, pretend that you're the control error. What do you see? Well, you see the reference value from the electric power controller. Very slow variation. But you also see the neutron flux, which is all over the place. So adding these kind of little signal on top of that really shouldn't be such a big deal. That you see the red curve instead of the blue curve. It's very hard for me to imagine that it can really matter in terms of anything would be dangerous, let's say. And then we try it on a more interesting data set uh, in the morning of January 14th this year. We had uh, two frequency dips um, below 49.9 hertz on the power system. And now this is the frequency. 
but in order to be able to compare it with how the controller would have reacted, I have flipped the frequency, so you see the negative, and I have taken away 50 to start from zero, and I have multiplied it by 10 on the next slide. There. It's the same frequency, but it means, maybe I have some, yes. Um, but it means here, here you have, um, um, yeah, this is probably 49.9 and this is 49.85, yes. And, and you see the, the output from, the, the power output as a response to this would look like something like this. It sort of, it doesn't go all the way up to 10 because when you have this feedback, you sort of diminish it a little bit. But then the main point with this, it, you see it gets a bit tired here after some time and sort of has to start to decrease in order to be able to fulfill the requirement. And you see the same behavior there. So this is, you know, it's, it's a relatively detailed simulation, but not tremendously detailed simulation. But it gives you an idea on the kind of performance that we would have. And if you look at, um, this is the blue one is the actual measured APRM from the same time period. And um, the red one behind here is what the APRM would be with the frequency control. And the black one here is what the thermal power, how it would vary. Thermal power filtered with, with two hours due to the control. If it would have had no control, it would have been just a straight line. But it's a rather small, smooth variation. Uh, we have made some preparations. We have sped, speeded up, the, changed the, the ramps, uh, speeded them up a little bit. We have changed the filter constants that were set actually a bit too high. And we have uh, made some other modifications. Uh, and uh, as a basis for this, we have had uh, measurements that we did during the power up rate. And then we did also measurements last year, one on Forsmark 2 which is this one, and one on Forsmark 1. Um, and this is from the Plant Explorer. We have a data acquisition system that takes every minute values of, of all sorts of parameters that we have, and this is the active, uh, is this the, out, the, the fission power. And, and you see, here we start the test, we decrease the power a little bit, and then we start to to put in sinus curves. You, you, this is the slow variation it follows, and then since this is sampled with one sample per minute, it's not in fast enough to be able to describe the later portion of this one. And our system here is, as opposed to the normal systems that Lynn were talking to, and almost any other system, uh, well, first of all, I just make a quick review of what Lynn already explained. Input, output, looks like that, amplification 0.7, phase shift 45 degrees, you have one point in the border diagram. Higher frequency, somewhat lower uh, amplitude on the output because it can't cope with a faster variation, and the phase shift is higher. So this is the typical look of a, a border diagram. However, if you take the border diagram from speed pump of the recirculation pumps to fission power, it looks like this, which is a, an unusual behavior that it actually gets a higher amplification the faster you, you change because the, the, the fission power will react, but the break, if you will, in terms of the, of the void will not be fast enough to, to break the, uh, or to dampen the, the input. So, and, and, the, and it's phase advancing, which is also, when we did the measurements, we put in sinus on, uh, on the pressure reference value, and then we looked at the resulting uh, APRM signal. It was before, and we were like, we were actually quite, what the hell is going on? <laughs> but we, 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 of course, we understood that we could see from all the measurements that this is the case and, and, and find a theoretical explanation. Um, we do, this is another one I also threw in after lunch, talking about doing calculations and, and um, comparing. 
normally it's it's typically also what, what Lynn showed before. The phase when you measure is worse than the phase that you theoretically calculate for. Because a pure time delay, get, you see that here. And you have time delays that you don't account for. However, in this case, our measurements were, were higher in phase than what you measured. And this is sort of peculiar too. But this is because if you take from speed as the input to fission power as the output, then you have a measurement delay in the input because the speed is measured with the tachometer. And the tachometer had to count, count pulses and then filter and do stuff like that. So you have a time delay you have to account for on the input signal. And then you see the, the circles are where we compensate for. This is a reasonable estimate, a 0.8 second time constant on the input. And then they fall in. So we can describe this fairly well. I would say actually quite well. Uh, when, then when you come from pump speed to electric power, uh, it gets a bit less, uh, you get more, you, you lose more phase. Because then you have the turbine, um, that's like any other thermal plant, the steam has to pass through the turbine, you have the high pressure turbine, you have some time in the reheater, and then you have the low pressure turbine. And if you take the full, the full loop, then you also have the controller and the filters and everything. And this, it looks something like this, so it's sort of comparable to, to one of the, I put in from Lynn's presentation, one of the, the stations there. However, this, we haven't really done much. We can do more here, I believe. We have more potential to be able to do, and we can focus on, on this frequency range that were of interest, I think, let's see, somewhere here, maybe. Um, that were of interest to, to help compensate for, to mitigate this um, uh, uh, 60 second uh, deviation that is. And, and I believe that we can do, just because we don't have minimum, non-minimum phase, we can also play around and phase advance the input signal. For instance, by taking, doubling it and reducing it with something that is filtered, that would face advance the signal itself. And that would, would lift up the, the phase here where you indicated was critical. Uh, this is an approximate body diagram of the amplification. So what I'm really asking, would it be okay to come with something that don't have one up there, but actually sort of down here, between 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 3, actually goes, uh, goes down again. Is that of any use? And the step response would also sort of, it would go up and then it would sort of decay slowly. You have 500 seconds there on the right hand side. Um, I have sort of pre-made some question and answers, <laughs> but maybe, maybe we let Maya see if we can find any of them here. <laughs> Would you like to take an answer or a question? Otherwise, I have a question, yeah. which I have understood from your presentation and from earlier discussions and so on. There is no such a physical thing that's stopping the nuclear power plants or the boiling water reactors to actually provide FCR. You can do that. Yes. Yes. So when we're talking about ancillary service and participate in the market and so on, uh, the next step to do that when you have concluded that you can, can participate and you said what you wanted to provide to the power system is the pre-qualification process, which Evert was talking about. So my question to you is, what is stopping you from going forward in the process and try to pre-qualify? Because well, from my understanding, I, I have understood you haven't done that. Because that's the next step before you can participate in the market. Uh, do you know what's, uh, what's stopping you or are you considering it or how well, far have you come? Basically, in practice, is that we don't get much answers from you when we just try to get somebody to talk with. Because you used, a, you can send in an application for pre-qualification. That will not, 
that's just on, on our but, but But also, uh, the one thing that is stopping us yeah. is that the, the present rules, uh, which I suppose we would pre, pre qualify for yes. with the 60 second uh, mm. time constant, when we are done, there will be another set of rules. Uh, well, we will release the new rules, I will think, in a few weeks, if I understood Andreas quite right, the FCR requirements. Or well, the rules for. Basically years. Yes, they have. So I think they, they are quite valid. Well, the, the, the simple answer is that we don't do that uh, because we haven't uh, received any responses or anything. If you tell us to do that, we'll do that. Well, go in on our website and click for the application, and we will be really happy for proceeding to pre-qualification and then you will have been an object in our list and you can put in a bid through your market balancing parties and then you will be but, but, on but also the market. we don't really want to go into a huge workload with pre-qualification and then you say in the end no we don't we don't want this because you don't have the static performance but well, that's that's we don't want to put in we don't dare to put in so much effort and money if we can't get an indication beforehand that, yes, this might be acceptable. Okay, so, but that's still the process that you need to do the pre-qualification to participate in our market, and that will be a, a discussion, I, I guess, then, for how to do that in a more cost-effective way and what the expectations are. And I think that will be interesting for the Swedish Radiation Safety Authority as well, because that's how they can they perform in a safe way. Any other question? Yes? Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the speed measurement with the tackle meter. Yeah. I, I wonder, uh, especially then in the beginning when they were saying that you have to fulfill the frequency at the PCC point where the, the bus bar is certain, do you see any difference if you take the frequency from a agreed measurements as compared to take the frequency directly from the rotor speed? We, we, it, it's the grid. We, we have two measurements of frequency. We have the rotational speed yes. in the end of the high-pressure turbine, and then we have the frequency from the generator. And we do see a difference in, in large transients. So you have a sort of a corkscrew effect. Yes. You can see a difference like that, yes. But if you wanted to do a speed uh, regulating, govern, governing control, which signal would you use? Um, I don't know which one we are using in our present controller because we do have that kind of operation mode when we are operating an island, island operation. Um, but um, uh, for this purpose, I s it seems reasonable to me to use the uh, uh, power system frequency because that's what you want to control. And you may have maybe other disturbing frequencies, which should be higher probably, but um, and it's, it's better quality too. Okay. And you have you can achieve even better quality than, than what we have by using instantaneous values and things like that. So I think you have better, that that's a better option, I would guess. Any more questions? In terms of business value, is it worth to implement it? I don't know. Okay, so you are not really, or like, what I am understanding is that the question, are you willing to invest into this without just to apply online? <laughs> yeah, we, 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 yes, actually, we, we would like to have some indication that we will have a fair chance to, to be qualified. Even we know that is one requirement we don't fulfill. And we would just have to have a, uh, some sort of uh, response that we, we, it, we have a chance. That's that's it. Any more, Tatiana? For which kind of primary control uh, the Swedish plants are licensed? So, for which kind of operation and uh, for frequency response you already have okay from the <laughs> authority? Well, we don't have okay for anything for the for it at this point. First, we need to know. Oh, so maybe if it's this first is okay and then apply. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So first, first the, there's only one one customer. Are they interested yeah. to buy this? Then, if they are. Then we go to the other authority to see if they, it's okay. 
But then I have to elaborate a little bit more about interesting to buy this. It is market-based, so it means that we have a competition in the market. Don't we have that, Mina? So we see bids. So we pick the, the cheapest bids, of course, to make sure that we keep the system costs effective and to the lowest price as possible. Uh, so that's why you need to do the pre-qualification and then you set with your market responsible for the balancing and so on, which will send in bid for your uh, ancillary services when it's most suitable for you and where you find that you have the best um, economic output of it. So that will be uh, during spring, for example, when the hydropower plants, you have spring river to handle. So there will be quite a few bids in the market for at least balancing, but I think also for FCR. Isn't that true, Lynn? Uh, so when you optimize that and you see how the cost and what will be shared, that's up to you to do that because that's why we have a market solution, market-based solution. I think that's what the Germans uh, are doing from time to time as well. So just to elaborate a little bit more about that. So it's not really up to us. Well, okay, then, then we won't do it. We will not do it then. Okay. Then it's done. If you refuse to answer any... But I, I think you're missing the, the basic question. The basic question Thomas is asking is, uh, can, uh, he's saying that they will not uh, fulfill all the requirements. They want to, to deliver, with the, deliver the reserve, but not with the state, steady state response. So they want to... I mean, so they can't just go through the regular qualification process because then they will fail. So I think that's... Uh, but I think that we, when we start the pre-qualification test, it's quite new as well. So we will do that from time to time. We have done it with Carl Sam, I think, which is interesting to participate with FCR. So you applicate and then you start a discussion uh, with us and then you move forward and see what you can actually do. So it's quite new, the pre-qualification test, as Evert told us, with new, new requirements and also new requir requirements for how to do the testing as well. And what's suitable, and that will be also what is suitable testing for a nuclear power plant. Maybe it will not be the same as a hydropower due to nuclear safety regulations and so on and so forth. And we have different for other thermals. So it needs to be adapted to what kind of producers we are talking about. So... Well, uh, we'll see them. <laughs> My question is for you, actually, more. But it's in, 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 it's in its current state, most of the regulations are for hydro. They are not neither for nuclear, neither for anything, even in all the equations. So in order for me to do any basic analysis, I need some better regulations that can talk about other type of units. So how can we see that? And even now in this testing, I've seen... And even in the draft for the FCR and regulation, it only talk about hydro. So how can I do my own analysis if that's the only thing that exists? So we will try to expand that and be more, as Andrea said earlier, more neutral, technical neutral. And we need to evolve our way how to do the pre-qualification. And the best thing to do that is actually testing and move forward and see what's achievable and what's reasonable when it comes to these kind of procedures. But the prices, how to do the eco economy val evaluation of that, you need to look at the FCR market and you need to do the impact assessment and so on and so forth with what kind of wears and tears you will have on your power plant. That's up to the power plant owner uh, to make sure what kind of, what's, what's, what's worth. Uh, and I guess those numbers can be achieved. Hmm? No, for water, for hydropower plants, but we need to do that as well for the, for the nuclear and thermal and so on. We see thermal power plants who can do this. So, and we also see how they're calculating this and doing flexible operation in Germany. Why can't we do that for our system as well? Well, you asked us to look in the previous investigation, what can you do, which we did. And we came to you a year ago and described this. Yes. I had anticipated to get some feedback, not that just pinpoint to the website and go do some qualification. And that's, um, I've been doing business all over the world with a lot of customers. But haven't we done any feedback? Because I, th I have seen answers, and we are having here a, a seminar, and we are putting in money, but and we are talking about But when I send emails things. to you, you basically don't respond. And I have been, you mastered me, that I am not allowed to get in touch with any single 
person. I have to send it to the yeah. registrator, and then I didn't get any reply. Yeah. Well, that's too bad that we are slow on that replying. That's just so an apologize from us, but that's how the pre-collocation, and we see that this process is going forward with all the power plants. So we see no problems to go forward with the nuclear power plants either. So, but I apologize that you are unhappy with us, Thomas. Uh, I think we will go now and have a break. Uh, we will be back at 15, 14.15, so 20 minutes. Coffee served outside. <laughs>